So you can access that on the website or the UH calendar. It is um, an event right. And now, Jeanette. Yay, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I'm just gonna project because I'm really short, and if I'm down there, I don't have the height advantage that Melissa has, so um, you will not see me at all. Um, so can you guys hear me okay? Right on, okay. So um, first of all, hello. Thank you all so much for being here. Also, um, we have a small but mighty crowd in what I'm told is due to a parking conflict with the basketball game. Quite frankly, I don't really understand why anybody would go to a basketball game over an artist talk. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but I am so happy to be here all with you today. Um, and so essentially I'm gonna go through kind of a lightning round of kind of the backstory on my practice, um, the recent projects I've done, and then the piece that has been in the works now for um, about a year and a half um, as the commission with the Mitchell Center, um, which is titled In Plain Listen. So, um, Melissa, I will have you pop to our next um, next slide. It might take two, some of these with videos take two. Hit it again for me, please. There we go. Um, so as you all know, um, or have gleaned so far, um, I, by technical training, am a magician. Um, my background started uh, many years ago um, as I got interested in magic after seeing a Siegfried and Roy TV special as a four-year-old. And I saw it and I just said, that's what I'm gonna do. And I did my first magic performance for my preschool class. Uh, and then I got paid to do a magic show for the first time when I was six years old. And I've made my full-time living ever since um, as a professional performer. Um, and this is the only thing I've ever done. So all that to say that I've spent my entire life having a really deeply vested interest in exploring magic. And that is just so intrinsic to who I am. I really don't even know who I am as a person in the world outside of being a magician. That's really my only kind of sense of identity. So um, I figure it makes sense to sort of situate our talk and having sort of a working definition of at least how I think about magic and what magic is. So one of my favorite philosophers, wonderful gentleman named Jason Lettington, um, he's currently in Antwerp, has held positions with a bunch of esteemed universities throughout the United States and abroad, um, but he has uh, focused a lot of his research on studying the sort of philosophy surrounding magic. And this is a definition that he uses, which I, I think is quite apropos, which he talks about magic as presenting a moment which seems impossible, yet as far as you can tell, happened anyway. And that magic is not about deception, but it's about the creating the illusion of impossibility. So I think this is something that at least I find quite Quite interesting, I think is there are some aspects of it that run counter to what we think of, certainly in kind of traditional American society of what we think of as, as magic shows or a lot of the tropes that are associated with magic as being inherently deceptive, which in a sense it is, um, but I think fundamentally it's really not. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna use this. Um, so he goes on to note that, you know, magic sits at this kind of odd place of seeming both real and unreal at the same time, um, as opposed to a lot of other forms and mediums which maybe have a much more direct sort of real uh, kind of emotion at their core. Like he goes on to talk about, you know, a romantic novel can make you cry, a horror movie might be designed to make you feel scared, but magic has this very uneasy kind of quality about it um, in terms of that it sort of, you know, goes really is, in his argument, is in essence very intellectual. I agree and disagree, we'll get into that. But, um, that, but the part of this that I find interesting is that magic does not neatly fit into any of our aesthetic categories, which is why he deems it as extra worthy of our reflection. Thank you. Um, so this is sort of why I find it very interesting in thinking about how magic really points to a lot of interesting cognitive states. Um, as we often 
again, sort of colloquially hear the term suspension of disbelief, which in a way is almost a weird double negative, actually. Um, it's almost a suspension of belief. Um, if you know you're seeing a movie, if you know you're seeing a horror movie, that is the belief you have, is that you're seeing a movie. So you almost have to suspend that belief to then kind of get into the movie, right? Um, so Tamar Gendler, who's currently the Dean of Philosophy at Yale, um, has some really interesting thoughts on sort of what in a lot of ways has been one of the, the ideas that she's been no, most noted for, which is the idea of a leaf, which is almost um, definitely not cognitive dissonance, but it is sort of this this tension between holding belief and disbelief at the same time in a very unique cognitive state. So the example that she gives, and this is all, you know, uh, this is a, from her main paper on a leaf, um, but is talking about, for example, a horror movie. Where if, for example, you're watching a horror movie, perhaps in a movie theater, and now especially with the incre incredible multi-sensory, you know, movie theaters that we have, if, you know, some monster is coming out of the screen at you, you inherently in your body understand that you are not in peril, right? But there is that emotional sense of fear somehow that still happens. So there's that weird kind of back and forth state. Um, let me jump to the next slide. She started working on this idea um, of a leaf, um, actually due to, I think, the better uh, representation of this. And what I think prompted her to start thinking about this was a trip that she took with her family to the Grand Canyon. And now there's that horseshoe glass observatory thing that you can walk out. And so she talks about seeing, observing people walk out on that glass Horseshoe Observatory in the Grand Canyon, where then you understand as a rational, intellectual person that there is enough, there's enough structural engineering to happen there that to suspend you and keep you safe. There's not, you know, there's not been what I presume are millions of dollars and years of time invested in a glass structure that is not stable enough to hold the weight of a human body. However, due to what she frames as a leaf, people will walk out on that thing and be like gripping the sides, you know, and being very, you know, again, having that, that rational knowing one thing and, and experiencing something different. Um, so that sort of is, is, she's talking about, you know, this kind of uh, discordant sense of a leaf, of a mismatch kind of running in two directions. Um, and it's not self-deception. You're not deluding yourself into being like, oh, I, you know, I know this is unsafe, but I'm going to tell myself it's safe. It's not that. Um, it's also not uncertainty like I had today of going, do I bring an umbrella or not? It's dicey on if it's going to rain. It's not sort of a, 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 this nebulous state of uncertainty. Um, it's also not a forgetting of a prior experience. It's not a, oh, I went out on this you know, glass observatory thing. I was fine last time. I've forgotten about that, and now I'm remembering that. And you know, it's, it's not that sort of thing of wondering if you're going to be OK or not. Um, it's, it's very viscerally different. Um, so she also talks about, you know, comparing and contrasting being on an elevated porch and how, you know, structurally, I'm gesturing because we have a structural engineer in the audience um, who I have to give a shout out to um, is arguably, can I, can I do this? Is it gonna, okay. Um, arguably, I was going to say he's the best structural engineer in the world, but it's actually the best structural engineer out of this world um, who uh, is the lead structural engineer for the space station. Um, like, no biggie. Um, uh, and he's also one of the coolest people I know. It's my cousin, um, Pam McVeigh, who's like, big shout out. Um, all right, well, we'll have this fight another time. But, um, but so for example, I would argue in my lay non-structural engineer approach that the porch, you know, if I go and visit my parents, they have, you know, um, uh, you can sit on a porch on like their, like, you know, back, like stairs thing. And so I'm, I would argue that within some variance of reason, 
that if you were to sit on that porch, that's as more or less as stable and as structurally secure, um, hey Stephen, um, as the glass observatory. You know, both of those are designed to hold the weight of multiple people at a certain angle, at certain, you know, weather conditions, et cetera. Um, but you could go on a back porch or back fire escape or whatever, and not most people are not going to sit out there and be like, and, and have that response, even though we rationally know they're both safe. Um, so it's about, so magic sits very similarly to this cognitive state of a leaf. Uh, and so I want to just set that up as why I think magic just purely in sort of a cultural cognition st sense is, again, deserving of our further inquiry. Um, thank you. Um, this, is, uh, this is all just more on the skywalk thing, so we can continue. Um, I, um, we're going to talk more about this in a minute, um, but to sort of contextualize why I immediately dove into the philosophy of all of this, uh, it's because that's sort of been a big part of my interest in why I do what I do. So as a young child, I grew up within magic that was very squarely within you know, basically the entertainment world. This in contemporary American and Western and really global society is how we think about magic as purely a form of entertainment. And that's what I grew up doing. And then when I was about 12, I um, met a dear friend of mine um, who would go on to be one of my prominent mentors. Um, his name's Arthur Trace. He's a brilliant magician out in the Los Angeles area made a, you know, you talk about somebody making a passing comment to you that ends up changing your life. And this was somebody who, um, I'm like, I'm, it seems like maybe we have maybe one or two undergrads in the audience. Um, he was, I think, 22 at the time, was just about to graduate. And as a 12-year-old, I was like, oh my god, this guy is 22 and has life figured out and knows all the answers. And so when he was like, you know, you can use magic to, like, express other ideas, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, yes. And so that started wheels turning. And then when I was about 14 or 15, I uh, got really, really interested in philosophy, just uh, personally, because I was the coolest kid in my high school. Um, but I kept gravitating towards aesthetics. I had a big um, philosophy anthology, which just like, well, almost like philosophy 101 anthology from my library. And the section in the back was all aesthetics, everything from like, you know, Plato until like the 60s, basically. And I, it really was very interesting to me how a lot of the questions that were being posed about sort of the nature of how we understand the objects and processes around us were very similar to the things that fascinated me about magic. Like, you know, what makes this bench a bench? How do I know that that bench is really there? Do I know, how do I know that, you know, the color that's brown of this podium is the same color brown that you see? I don't know, you know, how do we, how do we understand and perceive sort of the embodied sensory world around us? And philosophers were investigating these aesthetic questions, obviously through the lens of visual art and, and a lot of other performance arts. And I was going, my gosh, these are questions so central to magic. A, why is magic you know, not using visual art and sort of contemporary art forms as an investigative tool, and also why is, is magic not getting more into some of these deeper, more robust conversations and questions, and trying to sort of situate magic in that way. So that was sort of a revelation that was happening. And then around the same time, uh, I was getting more interested in magic history and was learning that if somebody had said to you, and I'm sorry, tell me your name, we met right as I was coming in, Michelle, if somebody had said to you, Michelle, what are you doing on Thursday night? And you said, oh, I'm going to a magic performance. 
that 150 years ago, that would have carried the same cultural weight of prestige as if you had said, oh, I'm going to the ballet. And this was all just really eye-opening to me, and I was going, wait a minute. Magic used to be this very culturally prestigious form, and basically due to a myriad of socioeconomic factors, has had this massive fall from grace, which now we think of magic, you know, people say, oh, I saw a magician at a school assembly I had, I saw a magician at a friend's birthday party when I was seven, or maybe I see, have seen magic on TV. And those are like the couple of, you know, instances that people have for something that used to be a really well-respected performance art form. So it's very interesting that now we've seen magic really just within the last about 90 years only have this massive shift in now how it's viewed in society. So I was kind of experiencing and learning these two things concurrently and I went, well, magic seems like a great way to explore a lot of what in my mind are much more interesting questions and conversations rather than just like, hey, can I make this ball disappear? Yup, okay. And also recontextualizing magic within the cultural atmosphere. And so essentially now for about the last whatever, uh, 17, 18 years, that's been my life project is to sort of recontextualize magic um, in the cultural art world through performance art and academia. Um, and so that a lot of the framework when I was starting to get really interested in magic, diving into the heart of perception and exploring perceptual questions, um, pretty quickly got acquainted with the work of Maurice Meliponte, we think of as one of the main, um, really after Hegel, the main kind of uh, father of phenomenology, and is exploring these exact questions. And so he talks a lot, um, you know, this was some of the early um, reading that I had done of his work. He was a prominent um, philosopher, um, really from the 19, you know, really existing kind of 1940s, 50s. Um, and, you know, so he talks about, for example, you know, if you think about like a Necker cube illusion, um, where you can sort of see a cube in one way, and then if you kind of squint at it a different way, it looks like it's moving, you know, popping out the other direction. Um, you know, he talks about this idea of the perception of a cube and how this sort of change in figure. Um, and he talks a lot about you know, sensible elements in the perceptual world. So this was a lot of what started to drive my ideas on the perceptual process and how magic factors into that, thank you. Um, uh, these are actually some quotes from, that I pulled from some of his work that ended up, I ended up quoting in a project I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but again, he talks about the perceptual process itself and revealing that the world is strange and paradoxical, which I think also is one of the things that magic is best at doing as I sort of wrap up my thoughts on, on the role of magic in society is that also part of the reason why I do what I do, um, and Jillian, I hope we get to talk about this with your class, is the idea that right now, the world is a deeply fascinating place just for this moment to be happening. In a very base level, the fact that I can stand on this elevated stage it, you know, that's whatever, probably 36 inches off the ground, that it is built in such a way that will support my weight, that my body is able to hold me upright, that I can form ideas in my brain to form words that get perpetuated through vibrations in the air that come into your ears that you construct as language, as a shared language that we symbolically have agreed to understand together and you understand the ideas I'm talking about, that's mind bending. Like that's total insanity. And so the fact that that all can happen, like that's very magical. And I think that is something that, you know, I'm interested in looking at in sort of the, the paradox that lies at the lot, a lot of the perceptual process and that magic itself points explicitly to. Um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna skip through all of this. 
Um, uh, great. Um, this is what I just talked about. Basically, um, most of the work that I do um, is rooted in mid 19th century parlor magic, um, which is where we saw magic start to really have this heyday of respect in a very certain way. Um, a man named Robert Houdin um, was the kind of father of was sort of the golden age of magic and parlor magic um, in France um, in this time period where magic would be presented almost in these you know, salon type experiences that we think of, um, of magic being presented alongside classical music, alongside contemporary scientific demonstrations of the day in people's drawing rooms, really as you know, sort of fodder for discussion, quite frankly, for society's you know, elite. Um, and so that's sort of the, uh, really just the technical school of magic that I come from is things that started to become prominent around that era. But there's a lot of visual elements that carry, carry over as well and a lot that I think is really interesting. Um, so um, we'll flip, keep flipping on. Um, so as we started to see magic grow out of, you know, sort of that mid 19th century time frame, really now we have sort of the development of modern magic performance as we know it. So one of the other reasons why I'm so interested in trying to have these conversations about what magic as a form, as an actual just like kind of technical craft is, is because magic really for our entire lifetimes has been explicitly marketed as easy to do. I mean, there was an actual marketing campaign that happened in the 1960s for TV magic cards that was quite ubiquitous, um, and that that was the tagline. It was easy to do. And as somebody who's done this my whole life, I could say with clarity that is not true. Um, it's true for some things, like the TV magic cards, like things that maybe you'd get in a magic kit. Um, however, magic is deeply interdisciplinary. There is so much that goes into the creation and design and execution of a lot of even very simple magic, magic tricks. Um, you know, things like a lot of magic actually has a lot of heavy duty mathematics happening. Um, not all, some. Um, again, this is not a one size fits all. This is a how to, you know, things factor in. Um, uh, there is definitely engineering that happens in a lot of magic. Um, there is so much deep psychology that magicians have understood how to use and quite frankly exploit over centuries of time that now magic is being used as a research mechanism for psychology, Philo psychologists and neuroscientists are actually learning from magic um, because that's how, that's how deep it goes um, in the psychology. It is so complex and so nuanced um, to a level that incorporates so many things purely just within the modes of psychology that are engaged in magic. Um, same goes for neuroscience. Um, object design and materials, that is a big part of what I do, um, is a lot of object design and being very, very deeply interested in materials. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, if you come to the performance next week, you'll see things like, you know, for example, I use a spool of thread. That seems like the most mundane, basic thing. The number of different threads that I have tried and played around with to land on the exact right one that feels right in my fingers and behaves the way I want it to, you would not believe. And that's what I do for everything. And so it's like, you know, there are certain objects that people can say to me like, oh, I want to know about every cardboard box manufacturer on the planet of a certain size and thickness of cardboard box. I can tell you about all of them. You know, so, and, and certain types of tape and certain types of, you know, certain types of whatever. There's very niche things that, you know, you really dive down into the exact behaviors and properties of these materials because you're trying to get them to function in ways that sometimes 
maybe they weren't designed to, or maybe they weren't, or they have to function in conjunction with another object. And so there's a lot happening there. Um, theater and acting, obviously you're trying to render a situation that, back to Luddington, seems impossible, but it's possible anyway. So there is, you know, there's definitely theatrics happening there. Um, optics, kind of already touched on that. Um, uh, architecture and choreography we're going to talk about later, but writing. Um, so much of what I do is a lot of very nuanced writing, um, and with a lot of magicians too. If, if, I, if I want you to pick up an object a certain way, but you can't know that, I'm going to have to give you instructions in a very certain way for you to be able to understand intuitively or contextually how to do something that you don't even know that you're being asked to do. Um, and so there's a lot of that where I will tweak and tweak and tweak word by word by word by word scripts for years to get those words to f be f essentially almost functional objects. Um, so that's you know sort of a lot of what's happening there. Thank you. All right, I'm going to dive into a few examples of prior work um, to sort of uh, so you can kind of see the arc of thinking, um, hopefully, and how I have thought about aspects of pieces I've made that have kind of led up to the piece that I've made for University of Houston. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to start here. Um, this was in 2017 um, and was um, a work that was uh, commissioned by the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Like Melissa mentioned, I'm from Chicago originally. Um, and uh, in the lead up to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago's 50th anniversary, they'd asked several Chicago-based artists, myself included, which was a massive honor, to create um, pieces of art that were responding or reflecting on certain um, pieces that had happened within the first like, couple years of the museum's history. And so the one that I made um, for them was um, a piece called Invisible Roses, where essentially it was trying to, trying to do and accomplish a bunch of things. But for people that came to the performance, uh, they would enter the museum, and people at the doors would ask, oh, hey, are you here to see the Jeanette Andrews performance? And if they said yes, then they would be handed a map. People were like, OK, great. And they would open it, and the map was totally blank, aside from a little like sliver down the side that said locate roses. So people basically had to then go on this scavenger hunt to find roses in the museum. They would end up sort of on a um, almost basement level floor of finding, it was uh, over a thousand, it was actually 1,200 live roses that we had brought into the museum. And then we had attendants there that would give everybody a rose. And so people were just like, what, what, what is, it? people thought that was the performance. And then they were told to actually take the rose, brush it across the blank piece of paper that they had, and when they did so, it actually revealed that it was a map printed in invisible ink. And brushing the rose across developed the invisible ink. And now they had a map to find the hidden performances that were happening in a newly renovated space in the museum. And they had to kind of take a back staircase to get there and all this stuff. Um, and then once they were at, the, um, at that space, they then um, would see a performance that was in response to um, a 1969 work that had happened at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago that was, by, was one of the first large-scale works by the artists Christo and Jean-Claude, where they used 10,000 square feet of fabric and wrapped the entire exterior of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago in cloth. So I ended up doing a piece of magic um, using large sheets of fabric. And there's a little video of that here. And it might have to hit a, yeah. Might have to hit a, yeah. There we go.
Um, so basically, this piece was about, uh, I honestly finished in lightning speed, and it was um, about nine months of me spending a lot of time thinking about invisibility and a lot of things about invisible ink and hidden messages and um, ways for people to sort of engage with the invisible. That was sort of my starting to be very interested in that idea. I read um, a book by Philip Ball that I highly recommend um, called Invisible. Um, and again, Philip Ball. And it's basically a kind of a, a long arc anthropological look at the idea of invisibility um, throughout um, uh, everything from the scientific, the moral, um, it, it's, it's beautifully done. Um, and so that was, you know, where I really started diving into this. So move forward. Um, this, uh, I'm honestly going to skip through this quickly. This was a piece I did called Invisible Gardens um, that basically was, I for years have performed a card trick um, where people take playing cards and imagine like performing a pick a card, find a card trick on yourself but not knowing how it works. So what happens is in the card trick, um, people essentially have two, they're able to sort of find the missing half of, they, they tear playing cards in half and they're able to sort of find the missing half of the card that they had. Um, around that time, I was very lucky to be able to take a trip to Chef's Garden in Ohio. They supply a lot of the produce for many Michelin starred restaurants in the United States and Canada. And um, that was my first encounter with seed paper. And I was like, wow, this is beautiful and a lovely idea. And so I went, well, why couldn't I do that card trick but using seed paper? And then uh, I had a portion of the performance where people throw the sort of discarded pieces. Basically, you would choose to keep some cards and discard others, and people would toss the discarded ones into the air. And I went, well, in lieu of that, why couldn't people do this outside or do this in an installation and then have essentially seed paper that was fluttering down into like a plot of land that then they planted and then that turned into flowers or vegetables or something. Um, so that was this piece that I did um, with the city of Chicago and a number of community gardens throughout Chicago. And then also um, it debuted as an installation with Mana Contemporary where I was an artist in residence for a bit um, as a, this was sort of the first installation piece that I did. Um, so uh, there is a very short clip of this that we can show. And we, rolled a bunch of live sod into their freight elevator because why not? Okay, thank you. Um, I honestly am going to skip over this entirely. It's a piece I did called Bottling the Impossible. It's less involved, um, less directly related to what I'm working on here. So we'll just skip forward one more. Um, actually, two more. Um, well, it's up now. I, may, I, I basically had um, a series of sculptures that were completely solid objects that were in completely solid glass bottles, neither of which was cut or tampered with or 3D printed in any way. Um, so this takes me to then how Steven and I connected, um, which was um, the pandemic hit. Um, and you know, here's, here's me doing lifelong performance. Honestly, I to this day, can I ask you a question as part of this? Uh, is, that, is that appropriate? OK, great. Um, uh, we're going to find out. Um, so um, I got one of the most exciting emails I've ever received, um, which was the email from Steven, um, who, if you guys don't know him already, this is Steven Maticio, who's the um, director of The Blaffer, and then um, at the time was also um, the artistic director of the Quebec City, I'm gonna say biennial, because I'm a very lame American. Um, and um, 
asking if I wanted to do performances for the Quebec City Biennale. And I was like, oh, yes, oh, it is, I think you said that April, in late April of 2020 or early May of 2020. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to leave the country. And, um, and so basically then through a series of iterations, we started having conversations about, and I started just thinking about, at this point, I was still living in Chicago, um, and I spent the next like month solid um, just making sketches on my, I lived in um, about a 350 square foot studio apartment. Pam is nodding, she has visited me there. Um, and I just had papers spread out my whole floor covering all the walls of like, if I, A, like never leave this apartment again because there's the plague forever. Um, and also like, what does that mean? What does a performance look like then? Like, what would I even do? I don't even know. And then I, you know, cause I, cause I wanted to email you back. Um, and I, uh, which I, I had emailed him back immediately and saying like, yes, oh my gosh. But um, I was trying to come up with ideas and I w remembered that right before COVID, I had been, at, before COVID, I had been splitting my time between Chicago and New York for several years because I was doing more and more pro projects in New York. And I had met some friends of friends who just started a new app um, called Gesso, which was an audio AR app, just audio. Um, and so, and they were explaining it to me and I was, and they had originally designed it in partnership with the new museum and then also were doing, um, walking tours and they were like, oh, well here, like if you open our app and you do our like Bowery area walking tour, if you just have your location services on and you like pop your headphones in and walk around, if you like walk by like the block where Mark Rothko's studio is, it will like automatically pop into your headphones and tell you that and then tell you like the history of Rocco. And I was like, that's incredible. Like that's insane. So this is 2019. So VR, GPS activated VR, this is all like real new. And I was like, God, this is incredible. And some tech artist should do something fabulous with this. And I honestly did never thought it would be me. Um, and I'm just thinking of like people I know who are already tech artists and I'm like, oh, so-and-so would do something cool with this. Like she would do something cool with this. So now flash forward like three, four months later, sitting in my apartment, like on the floor, just being like, what am I gonna do? And I'm like, that app. And I'm like, that was an outside thing. And so basically then I started um, kind of thinking on ideas about, you know, what that might mean to integrate technology into what I do. I've always been hardcore analog. And, um, but we think about instances like Clark's Third Law. Of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, which is true. Um, so thank you. Um, so that's how Invisible Museums of the Unseen um, became born, which basically was, is um, an outdoor GPS activated audio AR series whereby people could download the Gesso app. I ended up collaborating with this team and then um, people would download the app and pop in your headphones and uh, initially, um, technically the Museum of Chicago, um, Museum of Contemporary Chicago um, ended up, we ended up implementing it first in Chicago, even though it was in our conversations for Quebec um, long before. Um, but it happened in four different parks in Chicago, seven um, in, in Quebec, seven sites in Quebec, uh, where basically imagine if you went to a park and like a whole invisible museum was dropped on that park, like a whole invisible structure of like a traditional architectural layout of a museum. So what happened is you download the app, put in your headphones, show up at one of the designated parks. Let's say they were, well, I'm not saying let's say for this part. They were all, um, they were all dedicated. Each site was dedicated to exploring a different facet of invisibility, like gravity, air, sound waves, reflections. So let's say you show up at the Invisible Museum of Gravity site, 
there's sort of an entry lobby point where you'd get basically like user instructions and then would then be essentially on a choose your own adventure format for walking through the park akin to walking through different structures in a museum. So just as you would explore the halls and exhibits of any museum, then you would actually kind of walk through and think, oh, maybe I'll take this path. Oh, well, now I've encountered you know, an exhibit about air pressure, okay. And then you'd hear almost like a pseudo audio museum guide explaining the scientific and historic concepts surrounding that invisible form of nature. And then there were also ways that you could kind of play with and enact that force of nature upon your own body. I'll explain some of those in a, in a second. Um, but if we walk, walk through a couple of these. Um, so this is just, um, these are actually, um, uh, this, these are actually pages from, um, I ended up publishing a book um, about the project. Um, and so th these are um, things about, about that and just pages from the book, so we'll pop through these. Um, and yeah, so this is explaining this. Um, each wing of the museum was modeled after traditional museum architecture, where people would sort of enter a wing, go through hallways, etc. So you'll see that better in the video here. So a couple of the things um, that uh, you saw there, um, I'll touch on two ideas on this, um, were this sort of stepping into a gallery. That was these things where then people in these gallery spaces got to interact a little bit more. Um, so one that you just saw a clip from, and again, these are sort of all um, illustrations of what participants might have experienced because it was all very user, kind of user driven um, and experience driven. But um, there was a wavelengths in your vision, which basically was at one of the park sites, I went and I took physical measurements. Um, if you ever want to get a lot of looks, take a tape measure to a park and start measuring like tree trunks. Um, it's, yeah, you'll get a lot of attention. Um, so I measured um, like the width of tree trunks, the heights of the different signposts. Um, I was able to get purchase orders from the Chicago Park District about what um, species of grass was planted in a lot of the uh, Park District sites and how deep the roots were. Um, I took a lot of those measurements and wavelengths are just lengths, it's just measurements. Um, and so thought of those wavelengths as just the lengths that they are um, and said, well, here's, you know, the width of a tree, of this tree trunk is, you know, 16 inches. 16 inches is a wavelength. 
that corresponds to a certain frequency which corresponds to a certain musical tone. So basically you had the sound of a tree trunk that was directly converted through several steps into a musical note. And so I commissioned a violinist who um, was a friend of mine um, to play each of those tones. And then because it was GPS activated, essentially people could walk. Um, they were instructed to like walk a square in this area. And then essentially as things would come into their line of sight, they would hear the sound of the size of the object they were looking at. Um, so hopefully, yeah. Um, so um, we'll keep clipping forward. Um, this is the same thing, but in French. It's online if you want to listen to it. Um, uh, this is the other thing we're going to get to is um, I needed because a it was co this was like peak COVID. We're talking about like June, July of 2020, and I will not lie to you, my brain was falling apart. Um, and I went, I need some sort of structure here to make this make any sense in my own mind. And so I was like, how do I, I've never written sound before. I don't know how to do this. I don't really know how to make sense of this. So the way to give it structure in my mind, because I'm not a musician and I'm not, um, uh, whatever is to go back to what I know and that's magic. And so I went, well, what if I took uh, since I had four museums, I, what if I took four of the first magic tricks that I ever performed and look at the mechanics of them, just from like a typology, and then use like the diagrams of the mechanical components, and then that ends up being sort of like the structure of each piece. Um, so like these are two um, of the mechanical components of two of the first magic tricks I ever performed as a little kid. And then those ended up being the structures that sort of laid out the basic blueprints for like the walking paths that people could choose to take or not um, within the invisible museums. So essentially, um, and then that dictated how the audio went and stuff. So essentially, unbeknownst to everyone participating in this experience, they were walking out the mechanical like typography of the secret of a piece of magic. And so throughout that, I kind of started to think about, okay, what are other forms that like the secret of a piece of magic could take? Like, could the secret of magic of a mechanical piece of magic turn into a walking path? Could it turn into a piece of choreography? Um, so that's kind of how I started to think on this idea. Thank you. Um, and, then, um, and then that also was the framework for how the audio got shaped. Again, this is what, yeah. Um, cameo by Steven. Um, uh, this is from the Quebec City um, piece um, and, and basically just um, kind of outlining um, that and how that happened um, in Quebec. Um, um, yeah, so then that happened in Seven Sites. So um, uh, I have one last piece to talk about very quickly and then I'll talk about the piece here. Um, I've always, now in the last couple of years, been really interested in the idea of magic as thought experiment because a lot of times magic, like we kind of talked about in the beginning, is this, there is this very interesting intellectual thing that happens. You're like trying to figure it out and not trying to figure it out, knowing that what you are seeing does not compute with your natural understanding of the world around you, um, typically because there is some law of nature that is being broken. And so, um, so I'm very interested in how magic can function um, as a live thought experiment. So that was sort of where I got into my next project, which was called Taken by Artificial Surprise, which was on hierarchies of surprise. And if surprise is something that is def a defining characteristic of human consciousness, um, I ended up getting the most unexpected and greatest honor of my life um, in uh, early 2021, which is because of a uh, you know down rabbit hole events, thanks to you, Stephen, because of Invisible Museums, um, which was that um, I ended up uh, being asked to be an affiliate of a digital humanities ra uh, research lab at Harvard. 
and invisible museums uh, of the unseen is what sold them on me being worth talking to. Um, and so um, I suddenly found myself being plunged into this digital humanities research space, which again, I never expected to be. And so suddenly I was around all these people who were like studying AI and all this stuff and I was like, whoa, this is so out of my everyday. And I had been for a couple of years prior to that been very interested in why certain types of magic and certain magic effects are more interesting than others and more surprising than others. Like for example, um, if I said to you, Michelle, pick a card, you know what's gonna happen, like probably, right? Um, if I, as a magician, ask you to pick a card and that card does not show up later, that would be, that would be surprising, right? Like that would be befuddling. So um, as opposed to there are other pieces of magic I do, which honestly I will not tell you in case you ever see them, that are so surprising, and I can say that because I didn't invent them, um, that are so surprising that it is like borderline shocking. And so I'm like, why is that? That there are some things that people, there's an intrinsic sort of like, ah, yes, there's a sense of completion because we knew that would happen anyway. And then there's other things where it's like really surprising. So I started thinking very much about this topic in late 2019 um, because somehow it came to my attention that there was a psychology researcher who had written a paper about exactly this topic. Um, we can flip to the next one, um, which is uh, uh, if you all want to get a niche grant, it's they're out there. Um, here's one on. Uh, he wrote a paper on revealing ontological commitments by magic, um, which is all about transformation of objects within magic tricks. Um, and so basically his paper answered my question, um, which was, for example, if I, if I were to do a magic trick and I transform a glass of water into a glass of milk, that is maybe surprising but not like deeply surprising, right? If I transform a glass of milk into a dove, that's surprising. Arguably, if I transform a glass of milk into a dinosaur, that is arguably actually less surprising. That's just like weird and shocking. There's not um, a mental through line that makes sense between those two objects like there is between the glass of milk and the dove. So um, basically my, what Griffiths talks about, and then I sort of um, later uh, expanded upon in my own thinking, is there has to be a point of similarity and a point of dissimilarity. So like the, um, my sort of categories that I came up with were um, scale, color, animacy, and material. He talks mainly about animacy. Um, but the glass of water being transformed into a glass of milk, those two things, same scale, uh, same uh, level of animacy, they're both liquids, and then same um, uh, um, material, basically. And then the only differentiating factor is the color. And even that, it's like clear to white. Um, if you look at glass of milk to dove, suddenly then color is the same, the scale is similar, but now the animacy, you're going up a trajectory of animacy, you're getting a more animate being. So then that's why that feels more surprising to us, but it still has those points of similarity, so it makes sense in some like deep-rooted way. Um, so I was getting so interested in this. And then it came um, to my attention around that um, as I became affiliated with Meta Lab, that um, a colleague of mine in the group was like, oh, have you ever read the 1950 paper by Alan Turing on computational intelligence? And I was like, no, man, um, no. And he was like, I think you should read it. It's got a section in it that's all about surprise that I think you'd find interesting. And he didn't know that that was just something I was like deeply vested in anyway. And so um, in, in the paper, um, Turing sort of refutes 
um, there, there's a famous um, argument he makes called the Lady Lovelace objection, where he's um, sort of refuting the points of Ada Lovelace, who, um, uh, and I'm saying all this because I didn't know any of this until like two years ago, um, was really known as being the first modern computer programmer. She was a mathematician um, and deeply important figure um, in shaping our world entirely. And um, she, she says that um, it basically that it is impossible for a, ma a machine to take a human by surprise because we as humans have designed it. Um, Turing refutes that and he says, I get taken by surprise by machines all the time. Um, and he builds a bunch of arguments as to why and the mathematics, et cetera. Um, so that ends up being part of how he constructs his argument on what we now understand as the Turing test. Um, and that is all, um, I'll view flip to the next one. It might even be two over. Yeah, we'll go to one more. Um, where he talks about um, where this is where he creates the Turing test, which is actually the imitation game. Um, this is where they got the title for the movie um, is from the paper. And basically, uh, he makes this thought experiment that he visually borrows language from uh, Victorian parlor games. And there were a lot of these parlor games around that time where people would have see these sort of text-based games and writing-based games. And he used that as inspiration for the Turing test and the imitation game, which is where one poses a series of questions to two hidden players um, to determine which one is a computer and which one is a human. So every time you have to do an annoying recapture, that's actually a Turing test which is this imitation game. So, um, so that was sort of the, how do you differentiate a human from a machine? Um, part of the argument that he's constructing that on is whether or not a human can be taken by surprise um, by a machine. So um, one of my other colleagues uh, posed what I think is one of the greatest questions I've ever heard, um, which he said, well, uh, is there, a similarity between the Victorian parlor games that he's referencing in the paper and Victorian parlor magic. And I was like, yes. And he said, is Victorian parlor magic, because we never know each other well, he said, is Victorian parlor magic something that's in your wheelhouse? And I said, yes, that's like my main thing. And he said, is Victorian parlor magic an interesting way to look at whether or not a machine can take a human by surprise. And I was like, yes. So that became what I then spent about the next two years working on, which was taken by artificial surprise, um, which um, we'll clip to the next um, uh, thing, um, which, uh, sorry, this is a slide clearly pulled from an older presentation, apologies. Um, on um, Basically, I worked um, with a, uh, an amazing um, computer programmer um, who at the time was at the Yale Digital Humanities Lab, um, Doug Duhame, who he and I worked together to take um, late 19th century um, magic catalogs and use that text as training data to try to create an algorithm that would generate text descriptions for pieces of magic that would be more or less surprising based on those surprise factors that I just talked about in terms of objecthood, um, scale, color, animacy, and material, um, and then thinking about what object transformations would be posed as more or less surprising. I then took some of those outputs and then Basically, I had the description for an end result piece of magic, and then I had to figure out ways to perform them. Um, and then how that presented, and sort of the end uh, result there was I had um, a sort of live, uh, live thought experiment that was an installation and performance art series and a short film. Um, but the performance um, was that uh, set amidst an installation of curtains, which was referencing the original touring imitation game that all was about players hidden behind curtains, um, where people would enter um, the uh, exhibit and uh, there were a bunch of black boxes. People would roll on a set of dice and then um, the boxes were all numbered, whatever dice number they rolled. I would take an object from that box and then perform a piece of magic with it. It was not known 
to the audience whether what they were watching was a piece of magic that had been generated using the help of machine learning uh, and, and had this sort of um, you know, computer-aided quality to it, or whether it was a completely historic piece of magic um, from the 19th century. And so people were just watching these sort of like weird visual things unfold, not knowing what was human created and what was machine created, not being told. And so the thought experiment is, can you tell? Are you taken by surprise by something that was generated by a computer or generated by a human and why? Um, so I think the next slide is a, a short video of that. Yeah. A little girl walked in to the grocery store and she wanted a chocolate covered ice cream cone. She told the man behind the counter what flavor she wanted and he said he was sorry, he didn't have any. A little while later, a boy came into the store after her. He wanted some ice cream for his mom and he too wanted a chocolate covered ice cream cone. When the man behind the counter said he didn't have any, he set down his spoon and walked away. The boy followed the man back to his house, wrote it down, and exactly an hour later, he gave birth to ice cream. He then slowly started to eat a piece of the ice cream. Um, so that was taken by Artificial Surprise, that was um, last year, and then that really takes us to now. Um, and I'm going to wrap things, things up with this, I know we're running low, low on time, but um, uh, so In Plain Listen is having its debut performance a week from tonight. Um, I Technically we are sold out, but we just opened up um, a handful more tickets. If you don't have one already, I would love for you to come. Um, but um, so In Plain Listen is basically uh, sort of the culmination, you'll see, hopefully, it probably makes a lot of, a lot of sense, um, of I've always wanted to do something with Morse code. And I have been very interested in how it is a visual written form and then also sound-based uh, form. And I honestly think it was one of those like, uh, now and I ended up moving to New York full time during the pandemic. I moved to New York during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I think it was one of those like classic moments where I saw like somebody playing the violin in the subway. And I think I was kind of like in some form of a daze of malaise or something, I don't know. Um, and it was like, I've been rattling around this Morse code thing again. And I went, huh, why couldn't one take Morse code in the beep sequence that we traditionally think of and just like beep, 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 and turn that into musical notes? And then by extension, you would have a way to turn text directly into a more melodic musical notation. And I was like, I think that works. And so then I got home and I tried it. And I was like, yeah, I, th I, think, I think this tracks. And then I, I emailed the violinist who had played this stuff for me for Invisible Museums. And I was like, can you, I'm going to like write some stuff. Can you just play this for me? And I basically had her do like a proof of concept for me. And she played my like letter by letter translation. And I was like, I think this works. 
And, um, and so we'll pop to the next slide. So basically then what I was interested in was this idea of taking secrets that instead of being hidden in plain sight, were hidden in plain listen. So I perform a piece of magic, and I have for many years, um, that was one of the first pieces of magic where the secret of magic was written down and published in the Western world. It's from 1584, and it was something that one of my sort of teenage mentors um, kind of insisted that I learn. And so I've performed that piece for a number of years, and um, so I look at that as you know this, this beautiful historic secret that has like a special place within magic and in my own in my own life and in the life of my community and when can i take that 16th century text that is a literal like take your left thumb move it to your right hand you know like that sort of nitty gritty technical instruction turn that into morse code and then turn that into auditory morse code and my musical notation morse code so then what that basically turns into is now you have the 16th century text that now has been turned into basically a verbatim score that is like a 45 minute long score for solo cello. So you are listening to the secret of one of the first pieces of magic in written human history. That's what you were listening to when you came in, in the hall. Um, so I've been very interested in how, you know, magic is this traditionally very analog medium. It's traditionally things handed down in books and from person to person. Um, and, you know, how that happens. And then just generally, especially now, within the last hundred years of time um, in society at large, we're watching the lightning speed evolution of how we transmit information, and now especially secret information, across time, across mediums, and how, how this information is getting stored and translated um, and evolving so quickly. Um, so I think that's, that was some things I was interested in exploring. So um, uh, for anybody who's not familiar, which I was not until I did this project, here's the visual form of international Morse code. Um, flip to the next. Um, I'm going to see if we can get this audio to play. Um... So that's the Morse code we're used to seeing and then hearing. Um, and that ended up turning into this. So that's, um, uh, well, this is my entire key for my Morse code music notation system. We'll flip one more, please. Um, so you'll see the letter by letter in terms of like how I was maintaining the integrity of each of these, um, you know, beep um, sequences and the dot and dash sequences, and then just turning that into a music notation system that instead had a much more, you know, kind of melodic thing happening. Um, so that, that's sort of the structure. This is the original text, um, uh, which again, um, this is uh, from 1584. It's from Reginald Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, which has a fascinating history. Um, Jillian, we, I'm sure, are going to get into this. Um, it directly came about as a result of the Inquisition. Um, Reginald Scott um, was uh, somebody who sat on the uh, uh, panel for an Inquisition trial, basically of somebody who was falsely accused um, uh, of a woman who was falsely accused um, of, of being a witch, um, basically because of a weird falling out between like the son of some official and some incident with her dog. And like, yeah, basically like this guy's drunken son got in some argument. I think he like went after her, attacked her dog and then she started screaming at him or something, and then the guy's son got sick. And then he was like, oh, well, because, because you were screaming at me because of this thing with my dog, and now my kid is sick. Clearly, you cast a spell. Um, and anyway, so then she was falsely tried for witchcraft because of this. 
And so Reginald Scott had to sit on this panel and listen to this woman be falsely accused of being a witch. And um, he was so deeply troubled um, by what he saw and essentially had to take part in um, that that um, led to this mammoth work called The Discovery of Witchcraft, when he, where he's sort of dispelling a lot of the stuff. It's a really interesting text. Um, and, but a small section of it is the first time we see published the secrets of like sleight of hand magic, because we were seeing some magicians be persecuted as witches, and then also vice versa. He was trying to show how, oh, here's how somebody could do something that looks like supernatural, but it's literally just like people moving their hands in a certain way and then making something that looks like that. Um, so like, stop persecuting everybody, please. Cool. Um, so that um, was that. So actually, if you jump back one quickly, that's okay. Um, so that's this this text, which um, I um, redacted because I have a massive interest in um, secrecy within magic and how an intellectual property related to secrecy in magic. Um, magic functions essentially as a trade secret. Um, so that's why I still wanted to maintain a lot of the portions of this. Um, and also because if you come to the performance, you will see me perform it. Um, and so I wanted to try to maintain that. Um, but um, so that's this chunk. But again, it is really getting into like, you know, bring your two thumbs and two forefingers together and take paint, you know, and whatever. So it is, it is really getting in, into this, but you're also seeing the, you know, 16th century English um, that's happening here. Um, so I will have us put forward one more. Um, so that's the original text. And so that then turned into in plain listen. So that's the score. Um, so then you're seeing then the letter by letter transcription of that entire text that you just saw, and then that's into the Morse code musical notation. Um, so this now sits as a, um, it's a 27 page score um, that is done uh, loosely in like a pretty formal notation, but not quite. I mean, it's broken up so there's room for improvisation um, for a player. Um, so that's, that's the score. Um, again, this is just a close-up, so it's a little easier to read. Um, if anybody um, in here, oh God, I can't, um, can't Kate, Kate, is anybody, what, what is the non, there's the NPR public radio station and then there's the other one, Kate, KT, um, KPFT, there we go, thank you. Um, if, if you listen to that, um, they have been playing in plain listen on one of their shows for the last several weeks. So if you've been like driving around in your car and flipping radio stations, um, even if you've just been flipping around, then you have actually, and like anybody in Houston has been listening to the secret of one of the oldest pieces of magic in written human history, just like as you've been driving around and you haven't known it. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I've been very interested in. And again, it's like subconscious secret information. Um, uh, final couple of things um, is um, this now all is being brought, uh, you know, we have been having these conversations about me being a visiting artist for the Mitchell Center um, for the last year and a half um, and very seriously about this project for the last year. It's now all finally coming coming um, to life. And I recorded the piece in a recording studio back home in New York um, about three weeks ago um, with, uh, it's a really fabulous studio called The Ice Plant. Um, and, uh, and then I met, um, the cellist is mainly, uh, really known as the best experimental cellist in New York City. They're a pioneer works artist in residence um, in November of this upcoming year. Issei Her, uh, classically trained, uh, incredible cellist, but uh, very experimental, pushing every boundary um, imaginable. Um, and is just like, uh, we are all just watching her career skyrocket. It's really exciting. So she's gonna be coming in next week. Um, but uh, this is some behind the scenes um, from the recording session a few weeks ago, and then you'll also hear a chunk um, of the recorded score. 
in performance. This is played by a solo cellist. Uh, the recordings that we did today here in New York were performed by Issei Her, and then in more um, live performance, um, it will be myself and Issei or another cellist performing the cello piece um, and then in tandem with myself performing the piece of magic. So you're getting to sort of hear in plain listen the secret of the piece of magic that then you are also visually watching. So you're getting the auditory sort of hidden abstract version of the secret while also watching the original piece of magic. So really trying to kind of cross cross time, cross medium, explore this idea of secrecy and things being hidden in plain sight and hidden, in this case, in plain listen. So it's a little clip of it. Um, and then uh, if and when you come next week, um, you'll, you'll hear the uh, the audio, obviously, Issei will be here playing it, and then I will be performing the piece of magic in tandem with her playing it. So you'll be watching the piece of magic and listening to the secret of it in music form. Um, and then it's all going to be set amidst um, a site-specific installation at the School of Architecture in the historic Allen Room, um, which I could talk about forever, but I'm already over time because I'm like the most verbose person you'll ever meet. Um, so uh, I'll leave that to talk about later, but um, I think there might be like one, one slide after this, maybe? Um, one more? Oh, no, there's not. Oh, um, all right, so uh, this is, uh, 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 actually, keep going. Uh, the, the end with my stuff was the end. Um, yeah, um, great. Um, basically, like this is me. Say hi. Stay in touch. Um, would love to have you all come. I want to give my most. Oh, like this is the most excited um, I've been about a project I've done. Like most, like genuinely excited about something I really feel um, really like content with. Um, and so I just want to th th thank you to Stephen for like finding me and, and proposing me for this. Thank you to Melissa who's been stuck with me for the last year and a half on this whole thing and just been like one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. Um, Sarah for being there the whole time. Jennifer has been like pumping out, um, you know, stuff on this. Um, and everybody and, and Pam who's just, you know, been my family for my whole life um, and been very cool um, and, you know, keeps the space station above us all. Um, science. So um, yeah, um, so I hope you all come um, and that's it. Um, that's all I got. <laughs>were we going to do questions or I'm already over? Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to chat. I'm also happy to chat with you afterwards. Otherwise, we'll just talk later. Thank you all for coming, everybody. Thank you.